All righty, all righty, on a hump day, Scott Payton joins us. Just the people were asking, that lawsuit filed uh, Monday of this week against country music star Morgan Wallen was withdrawn. It looks like a change of strategy. Uh, yesterday morning in federal court, the first lawsuit against Wallen had been withdrawn. More people are coming forward to sue the country music superstar, class action suit, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that is where that stands. We'll have an update for you a little bit later on. I want to get back to this because we were talking to uh, Scott about this. Uh, certainly, I think this would be the the real identity of a of a of a crime victim when you think that that person is going to be back into your neighborhood. What does your organization do to put some weight behind the seriousness of this to make first of all sure that this guy has been re- rehabilitated? Great question, Paul, and and. Let's kind of step back a little bit on this parole decision of, of Williams. I've uh, been mm-hmm. following it closely in the news, and, and anything I say is going to be based solely on what I've read and heard. I, I do not have the facts in front of me as far as what the parole board saw or considered. Um, but he is eligible for parole because of the five Supreme Court decisions um, regarding juvenile lifers without parole. So um, this is not a policy coming from under the dome. Um, our legislature did not vote on um, well, I understand this, that. this particular, understand. particular but, but, part. But it's so, also not mandatory volunteer, I, I, uh, mandatory parole, so absolutely, regardless and, of what the Supreme Court said. Absolutely, and, and that, that brings to a point of what, what we advocate for is that each case needs to be looked at individually. Uh, the parole board should have all the facts in front of them from uh, what efforts they did to, to rehabilitate, um, what is the community's thoughts on this individual coming out, um, the prosecutor, the, the, the sentencing judge, uh, all the players in the criminal justice system should have some input in this parole board decision. And what we look at here, from, from what I've read, the family was not notified, is, is what they're saying. And, and yeah. if that is the yeah. case, Paul, that, that, is, that is so disturbing and, and so disappointing because, you know, our, our, our resolution predates this, but, but it it is so important because this family was not informed, they were not present, they did not have an opportunity to voice or to even hear what was going on in that parole board hearing um, and, and be able to, to let the board know um, their thoughts on, on this individual coming back into the community. To address your, your, your initial question, though, what Rhino Crime works with the legislature to do is to make sure that when individuals like this, when the parole board says that they're ready to come out, Mm -hmm. which we know that is not a 100% certainty that this person has been rehabilitated, but hopefully everything has been done to ensure that they are, and then when they are released, they'll be on parole supervision uh, through through the community supervision side of, of MDOC. But we need to make sure, again, going back to reentry, going back to programming, that the time spent inside a prison is productive time um, and that they are given the tools to be prepared to come out into the community and be successful and, and to, to turn away from, from the life of crime that got them in there. Um, this situation with the Williams family, Paul, is not your typical par- parolee situation. Um, you know, when I look at it and, and read um, the details of this horrific crime, um, that's why it's so important. We can't say that every 17-year-old that committed a crime should never be released, nor should we say that every 17-year-old that committed a crime should be released. Um, you made a great point that the Supreme Court simply said they need to be you know, available for a parole board hearing. I, I look at this and say, well, your organization is uh, going to be on the front row seat of this uh, for crime victims. And it just seems to me logically in this case, in the previous case that we had of Mr. Bell or any any cases before or that might come up, it would seem it's a responsibility of the parole board in some way to call a community meeting with the family and friends or at least meet with them and say, here on on paper, is why we do not think he is going to be a threat to you or the community when he is released back, if he's if he's going there. I mean, if he's going to move to Kalamazoo, then that's a, that's a different story. But still, he could return back home. But I think they have a responsibility as far as crime victims to come in and at least meet with the the people who are the most affected and say, here's what we've done or here's what he's done. 
to deserve this. And I, I would think that your organization would be one of the front runners on on, on making that happen. A- absolutely, Paul. I mean, that's what I mean. And, and those those things are in place. Uh, and that's why I said I don't have. Well, a, have they done them in this case? A, a, that we don't know. 100% certainty because we well, don't have Well, I mean, he's going to be released, what, in a few days? Right, but we don't have the facts of, of what the parole board did or didn't do. We, we do know what the family says, and I, I have no reason to believe that the family would not have attended this based on what they've said where they've, they've attended every hearing that he's had yeah. prior to Are you guys given any it? notification at all as far as your organization? When when somebody's going to be released? No, no, Paul, we we, we do not. We're we're yeah. you know we're we're not part of the the pro board or MDOC. Though I understand we, that you're a nonprofit we, organization. Yes, sir. Though we do work closely because we don't want these situations to happen, and that victims often mm-hmm. are left in the dark, even though it's it's. I understand. Where do you get your where do you get your fun, where do you get your funding? Uh, well, a, a variety of we, – we don't get any federal or we don't get any state funding, mm-hmm. so it would be private donors. Just, just, um, just, just donors, just uh, uh, contributions. Y- yes, Paul, yeah. too. And, and, you know, the ultimate goal uh, of right on crime is public safety, um, and we have to look at it through, you know, we, we want to stop crime, we want to restore victims, which is critical – uh, because victims are are the ones going through this. They are the ones that will, whether yeah. it is a simple burglary or or a murder, um, victims are, are traumatized from what happened to them, and we need to make sure that that their voices are. are Scott, heard. has anybody met with a family uh, with um, uh, Zeno or any of the Mangums from your organization? No, sir, we have not. Have they reached out to you guys? They they have not reached out to us. All right. Final thoughts, sir. Well, Paul, you know, I, I think when it comes to the parole board, um, that is a difficult, difficult job to have. Um, they have to, one, look at the, the horrendous offenses that, that come before them. They have to ensure that someone has been rehabilitated, which is a very difficult thing. Um, I do believe that, that people can be rehabilitated. Uh, in these cases with Williams, I have no idea if he's rehabilitated because I don't have the facts in front of me. Um, but I, I think the family definitely should have yeah. been notified if they were not, and they should have their voices heard before that parole board, uh, before this individual would be released back into the community. You you look at these, you, you talk about put your deacon hat on, and, and this uh, other front story here that's just uh, in the craw of a lot of people this morning, a man who escaped from the Mississippi jail over the weekend, is suspected of killing a man and stealing his pickup truck. This happened uh, yesterday in Jackson. Anthony Watts, 61 years old. I understand he was a, was he a pastor, or I'm not sure. So Anthony is 61 years old. He was shot and killed uh, Monday night about 7 o'clock on Interstate 55. He pulled over to help a guy who had, he saw he wrecked his motorcycle. Police said that the man shot Watts several times and then stole his red Dodge Ram pickup truck. Uh, Mr. Watts died at the scene from his Good Samaritan Act. Based on information gathered from investigators, the suspect fit the description of 22-year-old Dylan Arrington, one of the escapees. Arrington is one of four prisoners. Uh, None of them have been caught as of uh, a few minutes ago that I know of. Along with Casey Grayson, Corey Harrison, Jerry uh, Rains, who escaped Saturday night from the Raymond Detention Center, a facility near Jackson. Um, they thought maybe that they had spent the night on the roof and then escaped the next day. Hines County Sheriff Tyree Jones said the man might have camped out on the roof before fleeing the facility and going their separate ways. But um, a tragedy ending on one of these yesterday or a day before yesterday. Uh, sir, we thank you for coming in. I appreciate it very much. If you want more information, go to a Right on Crime, or what's on the website? Is it the same thing on the website? It is, uh, yes, sir. It's www.rightoncrime.com. You got it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate thank it very you, much. Paul. All right.